Hello, I'm Dr. Glenn Eisen. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and today I'll be discussing with Dr. Robert Kramer, the Director of Pediatric Gastroenterology at the University of Colorado, his recently accepted paper, Diagnostic Yield of uh, Upper Endoscopy in a Thousand Consecutive uh, Patients. Welcome, Dr. Kramer. Thank you. Nice Glad to, to be here. here. Well, we'd like to discuss your very interesting paper. What was the genesis of deciding to evaluate your last thousand cases? Well, I, I think there's a, a great recognition among us, certainly in pediatric gastroenterology, that we do a great many endoscopies that are normal. And I think with the growing recognition that we need to be really cognizant of what are the risks of endoscopy, what are the benefits of endoscopy, I think this is on the road to really trying to maximize our use of resources and safety to patient and ideally just improve the quality of the care that we give. Have there been other large series that have been published before that would be somewhat informative as to the yield and findings? There have been some, but uh, surprisingly not, not as many as you might think. Um, there's really only one other series that was close to um, the amount of patients enrollment that we had, another one that was about 1,100 uh, patients. And, you know, over time, I think we've seen the indications for endoscopy in children change and the type of findings that we are seeing in children change. So we thought there was really room in the literature to try to better develop, you know, what do we really feel the diagnostic yield is? And it, could this better inform us in terms of figuring out how we're going to get the most out of our patient selection? Right, I have to admit, as an adult gastroenterologist who doesn't see that many children, I was shocked at the paucity of literature that's, that's out there regarding uh, yield and indications for upper endoscopy. So you talked about over the past 10 to 15 years how there's been evolution in the change of indications for endoscopy. How has it changed? Well, you know, I think the, the most common indications for us doing them um, can be similar, but I think the pathology has changed somewhat in terms of um, growing recognition of eosinophilic esophagitis, um, really that can present sometimes just with nonspecific abdominal pain. And in, in, in this series, we found a, a little more than 7% of our kids with abdominal pain had eosinophilic esophagitis. And I think that really helps us figure out, well, what are the things we're finding that might change our, um, our management? Because certainly we saw normal endoscopies in, in the largest number of patients. Uh, and then the other, I'd say, most common finding was that there was either gastritis or esophagitis, which are relatively nonspecific, and, and one could argue how much is that change in your management to find that on endoscopy. So I think those are some of the, the bigger changes. Right. Is it still a routine to uh, biopsy the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum sequentially in every patient that comes through? I would say that's the standard of practice um, in pediatric gastroenterology, and I know that differs from from our colleagues in adult GI. Very much so. And uh, I think that the rationale is that if we're going to, uh, you know, put a child uh, through the anesthesia, and most of us now are using anesthesia to uh, do these cases, if we're going to put them at that risk, we want to get the most we can out of the procedure, obviously, um, while maintaining safety. But I, I would still say it's the, um, it's the standard, and, and uh, we do at times find uh, unexpected findings. Sure, when you look you find things. Right. So can you discuss the patients who would have a high yield of findings that might change management versus the ones that have a very low yield? Right. Um, well, I, I think it's interesting because when we look at this through the lens of quality, I actually think there's room on both ends of the spectrum because the, in terms of histology, the highest yield really was in patients with elevated celiac titers mm -hmm. uh, for screening. And then that, I think, plays into the narrative of, do we really need to do an endoscopy on someone who has very high TTG levels? Um, although our results would say, yes, we have a very high likelihood of uh, histologic findings in, that, in mm -hmm. that venue, you could say, well, maybe that's a room where we don't necessarily need to do endoscopy, but that would that is the highest in our series um, versus the lowest, and I think some of the room where we have to exclude patients on that end, or at least create a higher bar, higher threshold of when we're going to do endoscopy, are children who have failure to thrive or poor feeding issues. Um, you know, those patients were uh, really less than 20% of a diagnostic yield in, in those, and uh, so especially for those under one year of age. For me, as a result of doing this study, that bar has been certainly made higher. Okay. So there are patients you actually would not do an endoscopy necessarily. Yes, I, and I think that what we need are, are um, 
more literature, more, more data like this in order to better inform um, not just referring physicians but parents because parents are often coming to us with an expectation sometimes set in place by their primary care doctors that I'm going to send you to a gastroenterologist so he can scope you because your abdominal pain, you know, it's been going on long enough and, and a scope is going to give you the answer. Or be therapeutic <laughs> somehow. In some senses, um, one may hope that it's therapeutic and that we can reassure the parents that this is like the vast majority of uh, patients with nonspecific abdominal pain, that this is most likely functional in nature. So sometimes there is a therapeutic role in that. Um, but I would think that it's helpful to be able to go into an endoscopy, setting those expectations to the parents to say, listen, your child, you know, isn't having weight loss, isn't having bloody stools, um, really has no systemic signs of illness, just has nonspecific abdominal pain. If we're, we're going to do this, but, you know, the likelihood is, based on our data, that there's, you know, roughly a 65% chance that this is going to be completely normal. When you say completely normal, including the histologic results? Just Correct. Normal endoscopically. 60 and percent um, on, uh, in our study it was 60 percent normal on the histology side, 65 percent on the endoscopic appearance. Okay. So do you have any take-home messages for pediatric gastroenterologists as well as adult gastroenterologists who may sometimes endoscope those that are less than 18? Well, I, I think the main issue, again, is to be able to have some numbers to give some parental guidance, um, anticipatory guidance to parents. In pediatrics, we're all about anticipatory guidance to say, um, you know, the likelihood is that this is functional pain. We don't have to scope in order to find that out because even in the roughly 35 to 40 percent that did either have endoscopic or histologic findings, the vast majority of those were nonspecific esophagitis or gastritis, and one might argue we would treat that much the same way had we not done the endoscopy. That's an excellent point. Thank you very much, Dr. Kramer. My pleasure. Pleasure.